I, I tend to be a guy, I was talking to Micah and Pierce about this before we were setting up, I tend to be a guy who likes to know the game plan, even if, um, even like if I'm not in charge. Like it helps me to kind of figure things out if I can, if, if I have a goal, even if the goal has to change, you know what I mean? And, uh, and so I get, I get stressed or I get anxious when there are a lot of unknowns, like when, I, when I'm not sure how things are going to get done. I like to have a game plan. I like to know what's coming next. As such, I, I tend to worry too much um, or I tend to be a guy who over plans sometimes. I like to be the guy who kind of you know, you know the people who are like have a five-year plan. Um, I'm probably not as hardcore as some of those, but I always have like a dream or a goal or something that's out in front of me that I want to achieve. And one of the things that I am a firm believer in is that you can't achieve those kinds of goals or you seldom achieve goals by accident. You hardly ever stumble into, uh, I don't know, um, you, you hardly stumble into being excellent at something. It's usually a commitment that we've made or a decision that we've made. For example, I, as you know, am an artist, and that is primarily how my family is supported. And as I was kind of doing the numbers two years ago and realizing how much money we had made, and don't hear that to be, we made a lot of money, it, we didn't. But as I was crunching the numbers and figuring out kind of our dollar amount and what we had made, I realized, oh, I, I want to be making like three times this every year. Like, I have to be making three times this every year to pay all of my expenses and to pay for all of my supplies and my lease on my art studio. I have to be making three times what I made two years ago just to be able to support my family, to be able to pay the taxes and stuff. And as I kind of started counting, I realized, uh, so a couple of years ago, uh, we had a decent year, but I realized the amount of money that I had in income in art was equivalent to the number of pieces that I had painted. So just for argument's sake, if I, if I made 20,000 that year, but I only painted $20,000 worth of art, you understand that I can't make more than what I paint, right? I can't make more than what I create. So it dawned on me, okay, if I want to make three times as much money, I either have to charge three times as much uh, which I'm not famous enough to do, or I have to paint three times as much. I have to create three times as many products. Does that make sense? And I can't get to the next level unless I put in the work. You with me? Like planning, foresight, right? Uh, when, when I met my wife, when I met Michelle, it, it was a kind of a whirlwind thing. We met, uh, sort of. She sent me a, a message on MySpace. Um, yep. April 30th in uh, 2006, I responded to her that night. We traded uh, some AOL instant messenger kind of things the next day, right? So this was 2006, a year before the iPhone, okay? So, uh, and, uh, and I still had my cool flip phone. And, and so, which I don't know if it was ever cool, but within two weeks, we knew we wanted to be married. So uh, we had... We messaged back and forth, sorry, we messaged back and forth for a week and then we had our first date. And within two weeks of our first date, we knew we wanted to be married. And, and it was an interesting thing because uh, within, within another two weeks, I had already bought her ring. So within four weeks of our first date, I had already bought her ring. And then within another four weeks, we were engaged. And then we were married about five months after that. And so we were engaged for five months. We, we dated for two weeks before we started looking at rings. We, were, we dated for two months before we got engaged. And it's been an awesome time. But one of the things was that, like, I, uh, I knew, I, I was 31. I knew, like, somewhere around 25 that I wanted to be married. Like, I knew that I wanted to be married. Ask Micah. He likes to tell stories about this and shame me. We would, we would go play disc golf in the morning, and all morning we'd be playing disc golf and I'd be like, I'm never going to get married. Like, I don't want a woman. I'm good on my own. And then we'd go have lunch. Then we'd go play disc golf in the afternoon. In the afternoon, I'd be like, I'm so lonely. I want to be married. And it was like, it would be really that quickly. And sometimes from hole one to hole three, you know, like it would just flip flop, you know, and I'd go back and forth. Uh, I don't know how Micah and I are still friends after all of my years of whining like that. He has a lot more grace. But uh, all that to say, I started, I started putting money aside because I thought, you know, one day I'm going to get married 
and I don't have money for uh, I'm an engagement ring. I don't have money for a wedding. I don't have money for a honeymoon. So I started putting money aside, and I started planning. And I did this for years before I met Michelle to the point where every the end of the year that I hadn't met my wife, I would spend some, some amount of money on, on people. And so like I told Micah one, one fall, I said, if I'm not married by, or if I don't have you know, somebody in my life by December, I'll buy you a PlayStation and some games. And so I still didn't have anybody <laughs> that December, so he got a PlayStation. And then like the next year, my three sisters and my mom, I bought them all jewelry for their birthdays. And then one year I bought myself an upright arcade game of Centipede because it was my favorite arcade game uh, as a kid. And then the year that I had met M- Michelle, I had just put enough money aside and I was starting to plan a 10-day mountain lion hunt in New Mexico. And, uh, and I was planning that and I was ready to go. And I met Michelle like the following week before I booked the trip. And so, uh, and so we, got, we got engaged. I had money. Like, here's my point. I had some money. I was able to get her a, a, you know, a little ring and I was able to pay for a honeymoon, all which happened very fast. But I was only able to do that because I had been planning it like for years. I had some foresight. Does that make sense? I was planning ahead. And that's kind of how I tend to think. I like to plan ahead. So uh, all of that to say, I do it because I'm a little bit, uh, I kind of live a little bit in fear and anxiety. Uh, I also do it because I'm a little odd, but there, there is, there is a, a point and it is this, that someone who has foresight and someone who plans from the very beginning, who, who has seen the end from the beginning is our God. We serve a God who knows the end from the beginning. And I might do things not really knowing what it looks like in five years with a hope or an expectation that if I do these things well, then maybe I'll have this result, right? And, and uh, maybe if I buy this stock now, maybe down the line, it'll have this result. Or if I, if I work really hard at my art now, maybe down the line, it'll have this result. Or if I save this money, maybe I'll eventually meet a girl and be able to take her on a honeymoon, you know, and it'll have this result. Uh, but God, our beautiful, wonderful, gracious, powerful God that Micah just commented on how his magnificence and his hugeness, God knows the end from the beginning. And everything that God is doing, see, the things that I'm doing have a calculated risk to them. Does that make sense? There's a maybe these things will occur. I'm going to work hard at this. Maybe this will happen. I'm going to try this. Maybe this will be the result. But God, who knows the end from the beginning, every step he makes, he makes with intent to bring about the end. Do you see the difference? I I make plans ahead of times in hopes, you know, that maybe I'll achieve a desired result. God makes steps knowing that it'll bring about the result. Do you, see, do you see what I'm saying? You see the difference? I'm going to tell you a story that I've already told you before, but it's still one of my favorite stories. Um, in 1998, I was 23 years old, and I went to India for seven weeks. And uh, the, I, when I was going to India, the, the, guy, the guy who had set up the trip, he, he told me, he goes, look, I can put you there for two weeks to four months this summer. And I had a friend getting married at the end of May and another friend getting married at the end of July. And so I said, can I go for the seven weeks um, between these two weddings? And he said, sure. And very long story short, uh, I said, when do we leave? He said, we don't, you do. And I was going to go to India by myself for seven weeks. And I needed to raise about $4,000. I needed to raise enough money to cover my passport I needed to raise enough money to cover my apartment while I was gone. I needed to raise enough money to cover my airfare. And I needed about $1,000, $20 a day for every day that I was going to be in India to cover my needs while there. And so here I am, and I, I needed my passport. I was leaving the end of May. I needed my passport application to go in the mail April 1st so that I could get it back, mail it off to Houston, get the stamp, and go to India. And, uh, and so what happened was the application said $65 on it. You need 65 bucks. March 31st, uh, I had a roommate, Scott Donahoe. And March 31st, I was praying and I was like, God, I need, I need $65 by tomorrow. And I was very, very poor at this point. I had no money. And so $65 fell 
far away as 5,000 might feel, you know, uh, to some of you. Um, or if 5,000 is not far away for you, whatever number feels far away from you. That's how 65 felt to me. And I'm on my face in my apartment praying at the Park Apartments on 50th Street there in Lubbock, Texas. And I get a knock on my door. While I'm praying, I get a knock on my door. And this guy, a friend of mine who lives in the same apartment complex came up to me and he said, hey, I know uh, that you need a lot of money to go to India. He goes, I don't have a lot of money, but I wanted to give you some. I hope it helps. And he pulls his wallet out and he opens up his wallet and he grabs out three 20s and he hands it to me. And I'm like, oh man, that's awesome. Thank you. There was more money in there. And I was thinking, I need five more. That's what I was thinking, right? And, uh, but he gives me $60. I hug his neck, thank him. He leaves. I get back down on my face. No exaggerating, not trying to make the story better or whatever or make myself come off like a jerk. Or, But I get down on my face and I said, thank you, God, but you're $5 short. Literally, that was my prayer. Thank you, God, but you're five bucks short. I didn't have $5. $5 might as well be as far away as 60 uh, five had been. And I had made a commitment. We can talk about this another time, but I had really had it laid on my heart that God had told me I'm going to provide for this trip. So I hadn't sent out support letters or anything. We can talk about the logistics behind that another time, but just know that that was the, the state. So I was making, uh, I worked at a coffee shop. I got up the next morning. I went to the coffee shop. I made the best lattes that had ever been made. Don't believe me. That's fine. Wait till we're in Dove Creek and the coffee bar is open and you can have one of my lattes. All right. But made these really killer lattes, was really working for my tips that day, and I got like three and a half dollars. Now, I had no money. I had no bank account, so I needed $65, but I also needed 65 cents-ish. I forget the exact number um, because I needed to go to 7-Eleven and get a money order because the post office would not take cash for my uh, passport, okay? And so I have about $63.5 now. I go back to my apartment. I take off all the couch cushions. I find change. I move things around. I go through my car. I go through my roommate's car. I find all the change that I can find. And I am about a dollar short, okay? I'm about a dollar short. And I go to Scott Donahoe and I said, hey man, um, I need a buck. I need a dollar so I can go to the post office right now before they close. It's April 1st. I've got to get my passport in the mail. He goes, okay, man. He goes, all you need is a dollar. I said, yeah, that's it. And so I get in the car. He gives me the dollar. I go and I get my money order at 7-Eleven. I go to the, the, the post office and I give him my passport application. I give him my passport photos. I give him my $65 money order and I give him my birth certificate to get my first passport ever. And the guy looks at me and he goes, oh, hey, man. He goes, um, your money order is filled out wrong. He goes, we don't have our new applications yet reflecting the new price. And I looked him in the face and I said, this is every dime I have. And I showed him the application. I said, it says $65 right there. This money order says $65. You're going to honor it. And he goes, no, 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 you don't understand. We dropped the price to $60. We just don't have any applications that reflect that yet. So rewind. My buddy standing at my apartment door pulls out his wallet, pulls out 320s, hands it to me. I get on my face and I say, thanks God, but you're $5 short. And God is going, no, I'm not. (laughs) I know that the passport is only 60 bucks and it's beautiful. It's still one of my favorite things that God has ever done in my life, apart from salvation, my wife and kids. It's like right up there. It's such a cool story. And and I just, I, I want us to think for a moment that while you and I kind of, sometimes we see clearly like what's coming down the line, but most of the time what's coming is kind of foggy and the best we can do is make a step today that, that we believe honors Jesus and proclaims God and we have this result. But I want, here's what I really want us to know tonight. I really want us to know tonight that Jesus, that God Almighty who sits in heaven on his throne knows the end from the beginning And that everything God does, he does with the end in mind. He's working everything out for his own glory. He's working all things out to fulfill his purpose. Now that being said, let's get into the scripture. And then in a moment, we're going to be in Daniel. That's where we are tonight, technically. But let me me just tell you the story if I can, okay? So you've got this king, King Nebuchadnezzar. He is a brand new king in the nation of Babylon. And God has been prophesying for years. God has been prophesying for about 90 years that he was going to bring 
a people, tall, dark skinned, smooth skinned, who spoke a speech, a language that the Israelites had never heard, to come and bring his people to judgment for their idolatry and for their rebellion and because they have rejected God. And that's the Babylonians. And so Nebuchadnezzar, this, this new king of Babylon, he's the guy who comes to Jerusalem, he comes to Judah, and he begins to take all these people into captivity. And the Bible said, the prophecies said that he is going to take you into captivity for 70 years, that the people of God would be captive in Babylon for 70 years, okay? Now, during the first, during the first captivity, Daniel is one of these guys that gets taken into captivity. He's one of the guys that gets taken in in the first captivity. Nebuchadnezzar is going to take three different groups of people to Babylon. Daniel is going to be in this first group. And what we see is Daniel chapter 1 begins at this point, in the first year of Nebuchadnezzar as king. And every children's Bible you've ever seen and every like felt board kind of thing, if you're old enough to appreciate the felt board that we had in Sunday school classes, that's only like five of us. But uh, everything that you've ever seen is that when Daniel goes into captivity, he's this like little tiny boy, right? Like he's six or seven or eight or nine. But what's interesting is that by chapter two, King Nebuchadnezzar's second year as king, Daniel is already in a ruling position in Babylon. And here's how that happens. The way that happens is that Daniel and his friends, we call them Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, were supposed to go through a three-year school, being trained in the ways of the Babylonians and the languages and the culture. But in the first year, Nebuchadnezzar has a dream that he can't make sense of. And none of his wise men can make sense of it either. And Nebuchadnezzar is so ticked off about it, he says, unless you guys can tell me the dream and its meaning without me telling you the dream. That was the trick, right? He goes, I'm not going to tell you what my dream was. You have to tell me the dream, and then you have to tell me what it means. And if you can't, I'm going to kill you all. And none of his guys could do it. And so Nebuchadnezzar says, well, kill everybody then. And Daniel goes, whoa, 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 wait. There is a God in heaven who knows mysteries, And he says, give me a little bit of time. And he and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego go and pray that God would reveal to him the dream. And so he comes to Nebuchadnezzar next. And he says, listen, he goes, I know your dream and I know the interpretation of it. And he tells Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar spares him. And then Nebuchadnezzar elevates Daniel to power in Babylon. Daniel has been in Babylon for one year and he is elevated to power in Babylon. And Daniel does a favor for his three buddies, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and they are also given governing positions. One year into captivity, one year into 70 years of captivity. Now, 18 years later, 18 years later, Jerusalem falls and the rest of the people get taken into captivity who has already been in power for 18 years in Babylon? Daniel. Because God had a purpose in preserving his people. Through the prophet Jeremiah, he told his people, when Nebuchadnezzar comes and attacks Jerusalem, submit to him, surrender into his hands, and go into captivity, and I will keep watch over you there, and I will guard you there, and I will protect you there. And then I'll bring you back. And he said, but if you reject King Nebuchadnezzar's uh, attack, and he goes, and you choose to stay here in Jerusalem, if you reject Nebuchadnezzar, he goes, you'll be put to death here in Jerusalem. And so God had a purpose in sending his people to Babylon, where he was going to purify them, where they were going to kind of go through a, a disciplinary process and where they would be brought back after 70 years. And he immediately, he immediately puts... Daniel there. Does that make sense? He sends somebody ahead to be in a position of power. This isn't the only time that happens in the scripture. If you go back into uh, Genesis 37, we have this guy, right, named Joseph. And Joseph has some older brothers who hate him, right? Yes, no, sort of, okay. So Joseph has some older brothers who hate him and his brothers sell him in slavery to Egypt, Now, we don't know how long Joseph was in prison there, but he was in prison for a while. It looks like he was in prison for about 13 years. And when he's about 30 years old, Joseph is brought out of prison to start working for Pharaoh. And then this terrible famine plagues the land. This terrible famine plagues the land. And it causes uh, all the people uh, to be in desperate need for food. And back in Canaan, back in Canaan, the people of God... Um, Israel, his other 11 sons and their families are starving to death. 
And Jacob, the father, says, go to Egypt. There's food there. And by this point, by this point, Joseph is in a ruling position in Egypt. His brothers don't recognize him. His brothers show up. Joseph's able to give him food. Long story short, Joseph is able to protect his brothers and bring them into Egypt and give them a home there. But God sent Joseph ahead of time. God sent Joseph to be this kind of forerunner to protect the people of God. And he was there somewhere from 22 years to 50 years. It's hard to figure it out. But somewhere minimum 22 years to about 50 years before his brothers showed up. Daniel was there um, about 18 years before the rest of the people showed up. Fast forward 380 years, and the king of Egypt is commanding that all the Jewish boys be put to death. Moses is born, and his parents hide him for three months, and after three months, they put him in a basket, and they put him in the Nile River. Pharaoh's daughter finds Moses and raises him as her own, and Moses grows up in the palace of Pharaoh the king. And when he's about 40 years old, he goes out and he sees the people of God being mistreated, and he says, I, I won't, I won't uh, serve Pharaoh anymore. He goes, I will be mistreated along with the people of God. Hebrews tells us that he did that for the cause of Christ, for the sake of Jesus. Now Moses, who had been sent ahead, is here protecting the people of God. God, God does this thing where he sends somebody ahead of time, where he's, he makes a promise. See, all of these things, all three of these things, uh, Joseph, Moses, and Daniel, all three of these cases are about God preserving the promise he made to Abraham. God made a promise to Abraham where he said, I am going to make you into a nation. I'm going to make you into a nation of people who know me and serve me, and through you the whole world will be blessed. And he was prophesying, God was, was saying that, that the Savior of the world would come through the line of Abraham. And he made that promise. And God sent Joseph ahead to preserve the people of God. In fact, I, I will never forget it. It was such an interesting picture. Uh, Micah's dad, Lacan, in this church, years and years ago, I don't know, I mean, maybe right after we moved, maybe right after we got married, but maybe right after we moved back. So at least 10 years ago, I remember him teaching a message about Joseph and about the people of God going to Egypt and being in Egypt for 430 years. And they went to Egypt as 70 or 75 people, depending on the translation. And they left Egypt about a million and a half people. So they start off about 70 people. 430 years later, they're about a million and a half people. And, and Lacan said it this way, which I just thought was beautiful language. He says, Egypt was the womb where God grew his people into a nation, right? Like Egypt was this place where God took 70 people, this ragtag family, and grew them into a nation and birthed the nation out of Egypt. They didn't go into Egypt as a nation. They went into Egypt as a family. They came out of Egypt as a nation. Does that make sense? And the reason that that happened is because God sent Joseph ahead. The reason that they were brought out is because God sent Moses ahead. The reason that the people were able to return from captivity after 70 years of Babylon is because God sent Daniel ahead. And after, after all of that, after this, after, after jo Joseph, Joseph, after Joseph, after Moses, after uh, Daniel, after the 70 years of captivity, there's another one, Esther, right? And Esther is made queen. And her, her uncle says, he says, uh, don't tell anybody that you're Jewish. Don't tell anybody that you're of Jewish background. And then there's a guy named Haman. He's the bad guy, boo Haman, whatever, right? And he wants to kill all the Jews. He wants to put them all to death. But Queen Esther, married to the king, hasn't told anybody she's a Jew. Long story short, she's a queen for about 7 to 11 years prior to this opportunity coming for all the Jews to be killed, and Esther steps in and saves the people of God yet again. Because why? Because God made a promise to Abraham. I want you to think about this. God sent Joseph ahead of time to protect these 70 people because God to Abraham. God sent Moses ahead because God made a promise to Abraham. In fact, Moses was a direct fulfillment of what God had said to Abraham in chapter 15. When God said to Abraham, your people are going to go and be slaves for about 400 years in a land they do not know, and then I will bring them out. And God got them to that land via Joseph, and God brought them out of that land via Moses. And then 
Fast forward 800 years and the people of God are going into Babylon, but God says, but I have not forgotten the promise I made to your fathers, your ancestors, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and I will bring you out of this land. Therefore, God sent Daniel into the land ahead of them so that he could bring them out of the land. And then even after they've come out of the land, when people are still seeking to put them to death so that the line of Christ could not be thwarted, he prepares a place for Esther and sends her ahead of the people of God. Because God knows the end from the beginning because what God is working out, see, I I think, don't misunderstand me, God, God worked out the passport thing for me and it was great. God's also given me a grape soda and a new toothbrush and a few other things, right? Like God has done beautiful things. In in the 13 years that Michelle and I have been married nearly, we have watched God provide for us time and time again. Micah has stories of God's provision over and over and over again for his family. We, We know that. So don't misunderstand me. Does God work in our lives? Yes. Does God do things in our life? Absolutely. But The promises that God makes and the work that God does is for the end of the gospel, for the end of the revelation of Christ. Like what we want to say is that, oh, look what God did for me. God is working all things out, not for our pleasure, but for his, not for our glory, but for his, not for our magnification, but for his, that, that, There will come a day, there will come a day, Philippians says, that every knee will bow and every tongue will confess and declare in heaven and on earth and under the earth that he is the Lord most high. What God is doing, he is doing with the intent of the beautification and the glorification of his name. And that is richer than, look what God did for me. It's better, it's more powerful, it's more potent. There is hope in it, there is life in it. Because if I come to you and say, look at what God did for me, you go, great, but what's he done for me? And and if our approach becomes, look at what God has done for me, instead of God knows the end from the beginning and he works all things for the end, then I get to say what God has promised, what God has declared is true for you and for me that there is a savior, that his name is Jesus, that he is coming again. And so all of that to say that what God did through Joseph, through Moses, through Daniel, through Esther, what God did through those people, he did for the nation of Israel to preserve the lineage of Christ because he declared that through these people, the savior would come. And if they are wiped out, the savior doesn't come and God's a liar. He did this to keep intact his promise and the story of redemption. And now the story is nearing its culmination. And Jesus has come. As Joseph was a forerunner, and as Moses was a forerunner, and as Daniel and Esther were forerunners, so Jesus is his own forerunner. He has come and he has declared himself to be God and he has died on a cross and he has been raised from the dead and he has broken the power of sin and death. Some of the, my favorite songs that we sing, by the way, that speak of the grave being overthrown and death being defeated and sin being undone. He has done those things to protect the end game of God, which is that God would make for himself a people without spot or wrinkle or blame or any such thing. The same foresight that God put in putting Joseph in place and Moses in place and Daniel in place and Esther in place all led to the great pinnacle of the story that Jesus would be put in place so that we could be righteous through him. God made him who knew no sin, Jesus Christ, to be Uh, sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God. Romans 8, 1, there is now therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Ephesians 5, we the church have been presented back to God through Jesus Christ without spot or wrinkle or blemish or any such thing. And Jesus says in John chapter 6 that all that the Father has given to me will come to me and I will by no means cast them out, but will raise them up on the last day. We who have put our faith in Jesus, we know That every move that God has made, he has made for the day the sky breaks open and that Jesus is revealed as king and that God's purpose is complete. 
And I know we talked about the coming kingdom of God last week, and, and I'm going to sound really redundant and repetitive the more you listen to me, but I, I, I'm trying to be... I'm trying to be just a little bit more pure in my speech. And I don't mean pure as in contrast to vulgar. I mean the simplicity and the beauty of the gospel is that Jesus is core in everything. What God did through Joseph wasn't just some arbitrary thing for the sake of these people in this time. It was a thing determined by God with the end in view. Joseph, Stephen in Acts chapter 7 uses Joseph and Moses as Christ types. Daniel prophesies of the coming king, Esther. You know, the book of Esther was one of three books that nearly didn't make it into the Christian canon. Did you know that? Because there's no direct mention of God in it. When Esther goes to intercede before the people... Sorry, when Esther goes to intercede for the people before the king, she tells her, I think it's cousin actually, not uncle. She tells her cousin, she says, I can't go in before the king because he hasn't asked for me to come in. And if I go in before the king, there's but one law. He puts you to death. If you go to the king and he hasn't asked for you, he puts you to death. The only thing that can save you is if he holds his scepter out to you. Esther comes in before the king and he holds the scepter out to her because she found favor in his sight. All four of these people are pictures of Jesus. Jesus has found favor in the eyes of God. Moses, Joseph, Daniel. These are, these are things to help us understand what the story has been pointing to all along. We have... We have a better promise than that we would be healthy. We have a better promise than that we would be rich. We have a better promise than that we would be happy or that life would go exactly our way. God, who knows the end from the beginning, has worked all things after the counsel of his own will and pleasure. Even Acts chapter 2 tells us that Jesus' death on the cross was according to the will of God. Like, it's so easy for us to read stories about Daniel, I, I mentioned this in our middle school Bible study just briefly a little bit ago, but it's so easy for us to read stories about Daniel being thrown into the lion's den or Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego being thrown into the fiery furnace or David facing off with Goliath and saying things to people like sermons that kind of come out and say uh, stuff like, hey, what's, what's your lion's den? What do you feel like you're in the middle of right now? God, God will pull you out of that. What's your fiery furnace? God's going to rescue you from that. What's your giant? God's going to rescue you from that. And the truth of the matter is that whatever it was that tormented Paul was never removed from him. And the truth of the matter is that James was sawn in two. And the truth of the matter is that Stephen was stoned to death and that Paul was beheaded and that Peter was crucified and that Thomas was killed in India. And we could go on and on and on and on. And they died willingly, not because the promises of God had failed them, but because the promises of God were true. That he had a forerunner who went before to preserve his people and pull out from the world a people who knew him by name and called him by name and worshipped him and had been righteous and pure and holy. Like that's what they're dying for. Because there's a God in heaven who knows the end from the beginning. We, we chase such small pleasures. I mean, let's be honest. If you and I have lunch tomorrow um, and you, you buy me lunch because that would, you know, right? That would be a nice thing to do. Uh, so you buy me lunch tomorrow and we're talking and you say, hey, Ryan, um, I just want to know, uh, like, 
would you like to be rich? Like, if you're just asking me, hey, would you like to be rich? Honest answer, sure. Why not? <laughs> you know? I mean, people have said, like, how much money, how much money would, would someone, like, what's the, what's the lowest amount of money somebody could offer you that you would, like, gladly receive? Any. Right? Some people are like, oh, 5,000. I'd take 5,000. If somebody walks up to me and says, hey, here's a quarter, I've got a jar at home that I keep my change in. I just cashed it. It's a pickle jar. It was full. Last week, I just cashed it $375. Please give me your quarter. I'll throw it in my change jar. You know what I mean? Like, so if you asked, but if you asked me, what's your hope set in? That's a different question. If you ask me, would you like to be a famous artist? Sure, why not? But if you ask me, what is it that ultimately brings you peace? That's a different question. Because my hope and my peace are set in the sure promises of God. My hope and my peace, my joy are set in the God who knows the end from the beginning and is working all things after the counsel of his own will. And in the meantime, Joseph was sold into slavery. Moses was given up by his parents. Daniel was taken into captivity after the likely decimation of his city. Esther grew up as a slave in an exile. Jesus, fully God, was crucified by wicked men. All for the end purpose of God. Does that make sense? Like, sure, it would be great if it wasn't 106 degrees every day and if our air conditioner could keep up. And you know what I mean? Like, that would be nice. It would be nice if eating extra calories didn't mean, like, extra weight. You know what I mean? Like, all those things. Sure. If we're talking about hypotheticals, give me all the hypotheticals. That's fine. But my hope, my confidence, my joy are in the sure promises of God that he has been working out since the day he fashioned the earth. Does that make sense? Our hope, our confidence, aren't in the perceived promises God has made to us about whether or not our car is gonna make it another 50,000 miles. Our hope and our confidence are in the things we know to be absolutely true that God has sent his son to bring about an end. Here's what I want you to ponder this week. Seriously do this. If it's five minutes, if it's in the car, on your way to work, take five minutes sometime this week. Take 10, but whatever, just intentionally and purposefully take a few minutes to contemplate the promises of God. Not the promises of God about when you're going to get married or if you're going to have kids or what your job is going to be or where tomorrow's rent comes from. But the promises of God that he has been unfolding since the day he spoke light into darkness. That there is a God in heaven. There is a Savior who has been sent. There is a time he's coming again. And just like with Joseph and Moses and Daniel and Esther, there will be a time that he scoops up his people from the wretched, wicked filth they're in, and he brings them home. That there, that's the promise of God that we cling to. That is the hope of the believer. That is what our confidence rests in. Let's spend some time in prayer. Bow your heads and close your eyes if you would, please. Lord God, we love you so much. It is amazing how many times in my life I 
have focused more on me, my pleasure, my desires, my cravings than I have on you and the eternal promise of Jesus. But Lord God, all of our hope is in you. Even, even if we don't recognize it yet, even if we haven't come to the place where we've fully embraced it yet, all of our hope rests in you. It has to. There is nowhere else for it to go. There is nowhere else for it to land. There is no other God under heaven. There is no other name under heaven by which we must be saved but the name of Jesus. You alone are God. You alone are good. You alone are true. You alone are right. You alone are our only hope. And what you have promised concerning sending a Savior and redeeming your people, you will complete. We will rest in that in the meantime. And if our days are good days and if our days are bad days and if the days pile up in such a way that they crush and break our hearts, we will put our hope in you. God, this week, as many people in this room go back to school, either as teachers as students may we be the kind of church may we be the kind of people that as we go into these places into these classrooms among other people peers and students and teachers may we be the kind of people that show forth that our hope is in Jesus may we be the kind of people who represent well that our confidence is in the risen king we live in the midst of a hurt and wounded and broken world. And Lord, may, may you be so much in the forefront of our minds. May we hold so tightly to the promise of redemption and salvation in your son, God, that everywhere we go, people are confronted with your beauty and your truth and your grace and your power. It is in the precious name of Jesus Christ that we pray. Amen.